I am so sick of baby boomers giving terrible financial advice to young people. Not to get on my generational high horse, but I don't think they get it. There's a problem for the millennials. A certain amount of self-pity going on here. We're told to buy houses with what we save on avocado toast, use the savings from the job that we couldn't get after university, and then save for retirement using our stagnant wages as we get hammered with stealth taxes. I mean, sometimes I kind of wish I could argue it out. If I was to do that, I'd only want to do that with somebody famous, you know, kind of like a celebrity doppelganger. I'm talking to you, millennials. All you guys born after 1985 have no idea how hard life was. Well, hold on for a second. When I entered the workplace, it was the start of the great financial crisis. Resolution Foundation says millennials born in the late 80s earn 8% less than Gen Z. Yes, we've had tech advances, but it doesn't make up for the fact that many of us can't keep a roof over our heads. It's too shy to ask a girl out. There was no okay twinder. Yeah, but you've got a secure retirement. I mean, with good Wi-Fi, I can imagine. Want to know my favorite app? Rubik's Cube. You think Russia's a threat now? Let me tell you about a little thing called the Cold War. Okay, but what about the real things that matter for our future? They had nukes pointed at us for 20 years. You couldn't even skateboard to a blockbuster without getting nukes. Auto-enrollment, that's when you're automatically put into a work pension, has been a success. But let me show you a cash flow model. This assumes a single person enters the workforce at 23, earns the UK median wage of 34,217 from, from day one, by the way. They and their employer contribute the legal minimum, the 8% of qualifying earnings. And I'm gonna assume they invest aggressively and get a 5% real return, that's after inflation. And that's including charge as well. And if they did that and wanted to retire at 60, after 37 years of hard work, and wanting a retirement of a moderate income level as defined by the retirement income living standards of £31,300 per year, well, the money runs out at age 69. So I'm not exaggerating these problems. My friend Tommy went out to rent a copy of Gremlins and never came back. You know why? Nuked. Okay, I don't think this is getting us anywhere. This isn't productive, is it? And that's kind of the problem with this debate. So I wanna give you three frameworks and nine tactics, which I hope can help you plan properly for the financial future you're facing, not the financial future your parents faced. And if you don't know me, I'm a chartered financial planner. I'm a fellow of the Personal Finance Society. I've advised thousands of people on their financial planning and I'm a millennial. So I feel I kind of have some insight here. I do just wanna add the disclaimer that this isn't an answer to everyone's problems. A lot of people in really challenging situations and this isn't also something everyone is gonna be able to do. So please bear that in mind. It's intended to be helpful, but I acknowledge it's not gonna be able to help everyone. So when we're planning, we've always got to work with the end in mind. And have you ever thought about what real wealth is? This is gonna be important for your planning later. Well, my definition of real wealth is a mixture of health, relationships, time, and money. And they kind of operate in like a circle which changes in line with the seasons of life. You might be all in on money at one point in your life, maybe in your early years, maybe all in in relationships at another point when the kids are just born. But I believe you don't want to neglect any area of life. And I think younger people are always acknowledging that. You're not wealthy unless you have all these elements. The quote is, a healthy man wants a thousand things, but a sick man only wants one. I think that rings true. Relationships, you know, the Harvard Grant study, this is the longest study we have on health and happiness. And it states loneliness is a more powerful killer than smoking or alcohol. So we obviously need to try and maintain our relationships. Time is a big one. You know, Warren Buffett, billionaire, revered in his profession, one of the greatest investors, if not the greatest of all time. Also, 94, and every day he's on borrowed time. So do you wanna trade places with him? You don't, do you? Because time really matters. And finally, money. Look, we don't talk about it in society, but money is so crucial to how we live our lives. So if we work with the end in mind and we think that's wealth, how can we actually build a life which fits to our definition of wealth? And financial planning really can be simplified to its core elements this way. So let me talk you through this. If you look at these quadrants, you have earn, spend, owe, and own. And at the moment, what you earn pays for what you spend. And then maybe perhaps what you owe if you've got a mortgage or other debts. Hopefully during this point, you're also acquiring assets. You're building up what you own. And what we need to try and do when we're acquiring assets is for it to be one day when your ability to earn stops you want what you own to be able to pay for what you spent. So we want to design our lives so that somebody else doesn't do this for us. And I'm sure many of you watching this, you've heard the standard advice. 
But the reason why I think what baby boomers are saying is wrong for millennials and Gen Z is because it worked for them. But the fundamental truth of what retirement and life is has changed. You know, if you were a baby boomer, housing almost grew exponentially over your lifetime, meaning just owning a home was a path to wealth. Their jobs were more secure, often with guaranteed defined benefit pensions, so they didn't have to worry as much about retirement. And the path to university tended to lead to a reasonably paying job. Now, for younger generations, even getting on the housing ladder is extremely difficult for most, which delays retirement planning and has a knock-on effect. Relationships with employers are generally more transactional, less secure. And we're faced with a longer life, which is clearly a good thing. But it just means we have to think very carefully about how we fund this life. So I just want to show you this really great book and it's called The 100 Year Life and it actually has some huge financial planning implications. And it says statistically, a child born in the West today has a 50% probability of living to 105. A century ago, that was a less than 1% chance. Even since the year I was born, life expectancy has increased by five years. Now, clearly, I want to acknowledge you are not a statistic and no one knows how long they're going to get. But in this book, it does make a really important point that many of us will work into our 70s, perhaps even later, especially if people do end up living till age 100. So the typical three-stage life that we've been taught by older generations of education, employment, and retirement is likely to change to a multi-stage life where there are transition breaks, maybe even retraining. And they talk about the need from a planning perspective to invest in what's called transformative assets. And this is where you invest perhaps in your own skills or a career change. I think we all need to be prepared for this because I think this is going to accelerate further with the emergence of AI because even knowledge work is probably going to be disrupted because traditional jobs, which already were moving away from being a job for life, are going to be less secure. And we as a society need to be prepared for that. Whether that's learning to wrangle earthworms or perhaps selling a phone network. You know, it's all about range here. But I, I do think there is an insight here. The, the world is changing fast. So we shouldn't be thinking we all have a job for life and then we're just going to retire and sit on a beach at 60. Our working life and retirement is going to be different. And the thing is, in the UK, we didn't actually have an old age pension until 1909. You know, pen being a pensioner wasn't really a thing back then as far as a category. You just have to kind of die. <laughs> anyway, it wasn't until 1944 in America they started using the word teenagers. Before then, that life stage wasn't really kind of acknowledged by society. So the insight is how our human life developed is going to change over time. Maybe in ways that we don't acknowledge as much now. One thing to me I think that seems really clear is that whatever baby boomers got, we don't have that. So it's better not to try and live to the realities of their lives and be anchored to those expectations. I'm not saying that baby boomers are giving bad advice to young people, but I think it is outdated. So I want to give you some tools about how to think about it. You know, I'm no expert in how you want to live your life, but I am an expert in planning. So I want to talk about the tools we can use to fund our lives, give you three frameworks and how to approach this at different points. And the three frameworks are, well, one is asset focused, and this is where you do everything you can to build assets. So we need to commit and sacrifice to investing surplus income, any spare income we can into investing assets. Next is income focused, and that's basically where you improve your income. And cost, the reason why this is so powerful is because costs can be cut to an extent, but income is theoretically unlimited. So the question is, can we focus on increasing your income? We have this thing in the UK where sometimes we can have a bit of a love-hate relationship with making money. As I saw this thing online, I loved it. You, know, you can play the money game as positive sum, zero sum, or negative sum. This is so true, and basically what it means is that you can try and make money in a way that adds value to each party, that it's even on value, as in you exchange value, but it's even, or you take value from someone else. I like that, it's just about the mindset of what it is to actually create money and wealth. And the final one is lifestyle focused. And this might suit someone where, you know, you're not in a position where you might be able to save a fortune and you can't really earn a huge amount more, but you still wanna live a decent life. So while you might not be able to retire early, how about getting to a position where you can be a bit more flexible with how your work-life balance interacts? So maybe three days a week at some point to a later point in retirement. I'll show you how powerful these levers can be. And let's go back to that theoretical 23-year-old at the start of this video who couldn't retire at 60 on a moderate lifestyle. 
And let's go through nine tactics and levers so we can talk through how they may be able to adjust their finances so they work for them. So first position, auto enrolled, money was running out 69, pretty terrible. And these levers are inspired by my good friend Andy at Maven Advisor. The first is spend less and save. This is the fire approach, which I don't think is ideal, but if you want a completely frugal existence, if they save a bit more, we can bump it up. And we've gone from money running out at 69 to 75. So a very modest increase, but some improvement. Next, we've got earn more and invest more. This is the income focused approach. So let's now show you an assumption. This individual every five years increases their income by 10% in real terms and is also able to invest half of that via salary sacrifice to the pension. These nudges are so, so powerful. And we go from a position where they are now with the money running out at 69 to being quite comfortable and able to afford that moderate retirement lifestyle, maybe even a better standard than that. Okay, another one is increased returns. This may be only possible to an extent, but remember the Pension and Lifetime Savings Association said that about 26% of people know what their pension's invested in. So it's very possible you are leaving returns on the table. Next is save tax. So this is where you ultimately use the tax system. There was some research saying that a household is expected to spend a million pounds in tax in direct and indirect taxes over their lifetime. So we always want to be looking at a tax optimal option and how we can pull these levers, whether it be pension contributions, lifetime ISA, stocks and shares ISA. This is key. Five is reduce your burn. So you may have thought actually, you know, 31 grand in retirement, if you're on median wage now, that seems a lot. And I kind of agree. So what if they only needed 22,500 or it was a couple who had two state pensions? I'll keep them as a single person just so it's consistent with the rest of it. But if we reduce that income to 22 and a half grand, we're now at age 79. If we add in those extra savings I mentioned earlier, we can now see we're comfortably at the position where they can retire at 60. So knowing what you need in your expenditure is key. Six is be flexible or maybe work longer. You know, so what happens in this situation if maybe they reduced their hours from 58 but are happy to go to 70? Now we've got money running out at 83, which is still not good enough, but it's way better than 69 as we started. Seven is a capital event, so you might have a business sale or downsizing. I'm, I'm not going to put this in the cash flow model because it would just be a ton of assumptions, but it's a consideration. Oh yeah, the last final one, a little bit less aspirational, is die sooner. I know I'm not winning any awards for that. I know it's bleak, but there is an underlying point here is that while as a planner, I'd always look to run analysis to age 100. Sometimes that's not realistic. Some people don't have good health uh, and life expectancies vary across the country. So it's important to plan and cater that to you. Nine, the most common lever I use is a combination. And that's about understanding the individual, understanding, as I said, work with the end in mind, what's right for you and which lever should we pull so that you can live a life now that makes sense for you. So, so that was obviously a really quick overview of all the things you can do, but I really hope what you've taken from this is the media loves to catastrophize. We see these big headlines, millennials will never retire. And I just think this whole mentality is wrong. Why wait for that specific point at age 60 or whatever to build a life that works for you? There are a ton of levers that you can pull and think about and plan in advance. I just think it's so clear our generation will need to think about what retirement means to us and it won't be the same as our parents' complain too much. You know, if I was to look at my clients who've been really successful, almost all of them have the same thing in common, that they're optimists. There is a thread, but those who believe that things do get better over time tend to have better outcomes. The best set of data I've seen in this is in the financial markets. It's called the Dimson, Marsh and Staunton data set. And it's basically in investment returns from equities, bonds and bills all the way back to the 19th century. Do you know what they called that data set? Triumph of the optimists. Thanks for watching.